was to affect them from the war against the biosphere that certainly I have been part of, um, given the, the level of consumption of fossil fuels that, I, that I've done. Where, where have you seen, you know, where can we
uh, private oil company, you know, i.e. a company you can invest in, so in industry channels, they only want to matter, dropped 40% in three weeks. That's unheard of. It's quite extraordinary. They just bang. I, one of the things I, I, I love is that there, is, there are only two countries. I mean, I, as, as Norman tell you, I'm a bit obsessive about BP. I've followed it very closely for 15 years. There are only two countries in this earth that have given that company a real run for its money. The first was the US in 2010. The second was Iran in 1991. So let's say both those countries. <laughs> and of course, you know what happened in 1953. Um, and, uh, Raytheon's stock went up 20% this week. They make the missiles that would be shot into Syria. I mean, I have a, sort of a chicken and egg question as to which comes first, the oil or the military that uses the oil? Because looking at some discussions from a century or so back, the interest by the British and others in the oil of the Middle East was in large part to fuel the Navy, uh, to fuel the military. And these Republican Congress members we talked to about opposing a war, they said, yeah, let's oppose a war. But you know, you all are wrong on these, these, these tar sands pipelines. We need those so we can stop fighting the wars for the foreign oil. And I say to them, if we didn't have the military machinery, we would save as much oil as we're going to get out of those pipelines, and if we weren't propping up these nasty oil dictatorships, and I'm sure you have stories from Azerbaijan about what's tolerated there in the name of oil, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need. So, is, is does the military just protect the oil, or does the oil fuel the military? What what comes first? Well, it is a, absolutely a chicken and egg situation. Um, in the, in the, I mean, yes, it's absolutely right. I mean, the, um, the shift of the British Navy in 1914 from power by coal to power by oil was fundamental in shifting the British economy towards an oil economy, but that shift was done, well, maybe it was a, was a military shift. And under uh, an action taken by the first sea lord, as he was known at the time, uh, Winston Churchill. And, you know, the birth of the British oil industry really was tied together with that. Um, I think that, uh, to be honest, I think we can't get rid of one without the other. And one will lead to the other. Or at least it's going to be by shifting out of the oil, we will actually also open up the possibility that we can shift to a slightly different military structure. I'm, I am not an optimist that we can live in, move into Nevada with no conflict, um, but I am an optimist that the structures that, by which we wage conflict between ourselves as human beings have been different. There is a, there is a tangible difference between uh, a club and a nuclear bomb, and, um, and they will be different. The way in which we wage war now Will be different. In, is, will be very different in the future. And one of the shifts will be a radically de-energized military system. You know, you, you only have to ask yourself a simple basic question: How, how on earth can we run an F-16 bomber on the solar panel? To realise that, um, you know, that the, the, the changing from renewables to um, I will just illustrate a tiny story. There's a friend of mine once met to me, but was invited as an investment analyst in the city, is very involved in, 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 in environmental issues, and he was invited by, to go and meet somebody at the Pentagon. He was very surprised at this, and the guy wanted to tell him how uh, things were fine because they were, this was a while back, the, the delivery system of cruise missiles were now CFC free. And the, uh, the testing equipment uh, in Nevada was around so that was fine. And it's like, <laughs> but I, so, you know, I, and, and there is actually quite a lot of debate within the military about shifting to non I was going to say, I, I've actually worked with a number of uh, Pentagon, you know, retired Pentagon generals who, who kind of recognize America's vulnerability. Uh, to the global oil system, you know, and they've been, they've been, you know, I've had support on, against the Keystone XL pipeline from some of these people 
because they recognise that oil from Canada doesn't actually solve the problem. And you know, there's been there, there are some, I think there's kind of a spectrum along which some of these these people go. But um, you know, they recognise that uh, the wars for oil are you know have been have been very destructive, and that it's probably you know the, the Americans are probably into a losing game, to, uh, uh, you know, investing in guarding the Persian Gulf and the, and the oil, you know the oil corridors and so forth. And they also recognise. Uh, and then there are others that come from an, another point, which is an, a, another part of the spectrum that recognise that oil was actually a major vulnerability in their in their tactical uh, uh, operations, and that they you know they've been pushing very hard to develop uh, to get a budget to develop biofuels to run the stuff on on that, which I think is probably somewhat of a pipe dream. But it's been interesting how much opposition they face from Republicans in Congress to the military biofuel program. And you know, to me, that's very much about uh, you know the, the, the oil money that goes to those politicians. And, you know, right now in the Republican Party, you cannot uh, you cannot say a word against uh, against the oil and gas industry, and, and you know this link between uh, the corporations and campaign finance and the, and, and the politicians means that even even our you know top military brass uh, don't. Get a word in when they when they see a vulnerability in the in the in the, uh, in the country's military system. Uh, you know, oil is an incredibly profitable source of energy. You know, it has been it has been historically. It's actually getting less profitable as we kind of scrape the bottom of the barrel and go for these things like tar sands and fracking. There's, there's actually less money to be made. There's a lot of money to be made if you cut a deal in the, in, in the Middle East or in one of these countries where the oil is still cheap to produce. Um, but you know, historically and still to this day, oil is you know, going to be, make corporations far more money than renewables will. And um, that money has, I think, completely infiltrated the American political system in a way uh, that, that is probably one of the biggest barriers to change. And I, th I think James is absolutely right that there are hundreds of thousands, not millions of people out there who want to transition away from this from this system. And you know, I, I think uh, and, you know, our organisation has a has a campaign on this, and we, we have a website called Dirty Energy Money where you can go and sort of put your zip code in and your or if you you know if you know your representative senator, and you can find out how much money they've taken from the fossil fuel industry. And, you know, I really think this is one of the biggest barriers, the whole Citizens United thing, the whole campaign finance thing, it remains the biggest barrier to change on these issues. You know, if we can change that, and that's a, that's a big if, and that's, you know, it requires, some say it requires a constitutional change. But uh, if we can get the money out of politics, we can go a long way to actually speeding up this transition in this country. Yeah, actually, I think a third of the states have already passed uh, some kind of um, thing in favor of, of a constitutional amendment, Citizens United. That's right. Uh, but you have to get all 50 states, I understand. I might uh, be wrong about all Not all 50. We, need, you have to we get need a lot more, but we're, two we're getting there. Right, you know, right. You have to go two thirds yeah. and then three quarters. You never have to get all. You have to go so three quarters is the ultimate. You have to get two thirds to start up. Constitutional right. amendment process three quarters to ratify it. So you have amendment. like 20 now or something? Right. right. But what I wanted to ask you about is to bring the subject back to the current hotspot. I've learned two things recently that I wonder if you could comment on. One is that Qatar I apparently proposed a, a gas pipeline as the world's largest gas producer that would go through Syria. And Syria, in, in deference to their uh, their patron, the, the Russians, refuse this, so that's one reason why um, a carry is apparently saying that the Saudis and the Qataris will pay for this uh, attack on Syria, because they have their interest. And another thing is that I just read recently that a company that um, uh, Dick Cheney is uh, serving on the advisory board for, I mean, he, they actually released uh, from the Israelis the Golan Heights which is annexed, and they have a, a gas lease to drill in Golan Heights. This just happened recently. And I thought, these, there's a lot of things on that we just don't connect to. I, I don't know anything about the Golan Heights. I've not heard that one. That's interesting. I could say something briefly about the 
gas pipeline. Um, and despite the fact that I'm sorry, uh, I could say something briefly about the gas pipeline, as you say. And despite the fact you think you probably think that I would say everything in the world is uh, uh, determined by gas pipelines uh, or oil pipelines, I'm a little I'm quite skeptical about the story. I know the story. Um, and the reason why I am skeptical is that <coughs> at any one time in the world, there are literally thousands of proposed gas, uh, gas or oil projects, uh, pipeline routes, loads and loads and loads of them. And many of them never ever ever see the light of day. They kind of put up as speculation. Political speculations, financial speculations. Um, I mean, for example, when, the, when, the, when there was the, in 2001, um, there was the war in Afghanistan, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not that was because there was going to be a pipeline built through Afghanistan from, from, uh, from North and Central Asian states. And of course, there was, there were plans, and they still could be realized. Uh, but I don't think, in that instance, it was the central driver of that war. And nor do I think that the, the potential for a Qatari gas pipeline um, through Syria is a, a main driver of this war. The more significant in relation to that is, I think, is the question of whether or not Iranian gas will come to Europe. And I think that the, you know, because there all, there's an already an, there is already oil, uh, gas being imported to it. Europe from Iran, in small quantities. But it could be much greater, much greater quantity. But of course, that won't be uh, resolved without a resolution of the political conflict over that. Um, so, to some extent, I think you could say, I, I, I would, I go with the argument that to some extent, a war in uh, uh, Syria is a proxy war between over, over the question of Iran. Um, and in that instance, that uh, you know, it is related to Iranian gas, Iranian oil, future, which and in Iran has a lot of fossil fuels. Um, so I hope that's some kind of resolution. And the one thing, other thing I would say, just to the side, uh, is that it's worth remembering that Syria has a lot of oil in and of itself. It's not often discussed, not very much in the world scheme of things, but not a significant amount. And uh, we, we, uh, uh, we, we were part of a wider campaign to raise the question of what was happening with that oil in the early part of the, the very early part of the civil war as it's beginning to break out. Um, it was the oil was being used absolutely crucially to to help fund Assad's regime. Uh, and we campaigned hard that there should be sanctions against it, particularly because that oil, the dominant part of that oil was being produced by Shell Oil Company. So their oil wells were finance, helping finance the uh, Assad regime. We don't know the to be a, um, you know, we told them um, So I find, I find that kind of interesting. I mean, they don't, yeah, Shell don't uh, have assets there. Well, they, they do have assets, so they produce them. Um, what really inspired you and your colleagues to embark on this journey and to write this book? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, what, what inspired us um, to, to write work on this book? Well, um, it's a mixture of things. We're very interested in the future of, of the Caspian region as um, how much was the uh, oil in the Caspian region and the former Soviet Union going to have an impact on energy use in Europe, globally, and also world geopolitics after um, the shift from the Soviet Union in 89? Um, obviously, that became uh, a key question. Um, and we went, the first trip was in 1998 to, to back um, so they have that sort of technical aspect. But I can't get away from the fact that uh, part of uh, 
the interest comes in the pure delight of the place itself. Um, Azerbaijan is really some beautiful places, amazing people we work with there. Georgia is, well they say that when God created the earth, he, he forgot to, um, some story about the fact that when God created the earth, uh, he wasn't sure where to put the Georgians, and then he realized that he hadn't given them a country, so he gave them a bit of paradise you know, to, to live in at the end. And it is unbelievably beautiful. Um, the wine is very good. The wine is very good too. And also, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the way these kinds of things inter interact with our personal lives. And my grandfather told me a story once that he sat on a camel in the city of Tbilisi, which is in the, in the uh, uh, capital city of Georgia, in 1919. I didn't really know why he did that, and I tried to find out, and eventually I realized that he was part of a, a British expeditionary force sent to defend the early oil transport out of the Caucasus.